Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Saturday, June the 19th, 2021. It is currently 8.41 a.m. Central Time, and once again, I'm live on the air. Once again, I'm here in front of this microphone. Once again, I'm here in the sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church. And once again, we have a lot to talk about today. So I will be here for the next few hours doing live broadcast. As always, if you're listening to me live this morning, feel free to jump into the chat at any time. Say hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you may be, whatever time it may be. Offer thoughts, ask questions. Um, please, um, I, I that, that's always appreciated. And in many cases, it really adds to the program. If you're not listening to us live, you can always contact me via email, newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. Now, before we do anything, we need to spend a few minutes talking about two words. We, I'm going to give you two words. I'm going to give you the definition of two words. I'm going to talk about the controversy surrounding the two words, how they're, that these two words represent two different approaches to Scripture, and both sides would claim that their viewpoint is biblical and the other viewpoint isn't biblical, which, again, is very frustrating, at least from my perspective. But we'll talk about the frustration in regards to all of this in just a minute. So are you ready? Two very important words. The first word is complementarianism. Complementarianism. Now, let me spell it out for you in in case you're not familiar with the term. I think most of the listeners of the Theology Central podcast are very familiar. We've done podcasts about these two words, but let's start with the first one. Complementarianism. It is spelled C O M. P-L-E-M-E-N-T-A-R-I-A-N-I-S-M. One more time, complementarianism. C-O-M-P-L-E-M-E-N-T-A-R-I-A-N-I-S-M. Complementarianism is the viewpoint that God restricts women from serving in certain church leadership roles and instead calls women to serve in equally important but complementary roles. So women cannot, according to the complementarian view, that that women are restricted from serving in certain uh, church leadership roles, but that women can serve equally and they can serve in in equally important roles, but but in a complementary way way, right? So they can complement, but they cannot be the leader. According to this view, the complementarian view is that God restricts this and that restriction, those restrictions are found in scripture. That's complementarianism. The opposing view to this, or we could call this the other side, is called egalitarianism. Egalitarianism, that is spelled E G A L. I-T-A-R-I-A-N-I-S-M, egalitarianism. One more time, E-G-A-L-I-T-A-R-I-A-N-I-S-M, egalitarianism. I hate spelling things out in podcast form. When I'm standing behind the pulpit and I'm spelling it out, I can look, you know, at the congregation and go, okay, all right, y'all got that down? Okay, you need me to repeat that? Because I'm watching everyone write it down and they can look up and I'm like, okay, they've, they've got it. I can move on. But when I'm spelling out in a podcast form, I'm like, okay, I, 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 I can imagine I see you there writing it down. In fact, probably 80% of the audience is not going to even be writing it down. So how much time do you go back over it? But the two words, okay, I digress. The two words are complementarianism and egalitarianism. Now, complementarianism, let me repeat that one again, is the viewpoint that God restricts women from serving in certain church leadership roles and instead calls women to serve in equally important but complementary roles. Egalitarian, egalitarianism is the viewpoint that there are no biblical gender-based restrictions on ministry in the church. Now, this is, this is very important. So complementarianism, there are restrictions to women and being in church leadership. Egalitarianism, there are no 
biblical gender-based restrictions. None. All right? And this is very important. Both positions claim to be biblically based. Both positions claim to be biblically based. Both uh, positions will quote scripture. Now, right here, this becomes a very important thing to understand. Within Christianity, there's, there, there, and this is one of the things that's so frustrating to me. Within Christianity, it is absolutely insane how many things that people are, and that Christians are divided over, that we cannot come to an agreement. We cannot come to an agreement about baptism, but both sides, all the different sides dealing with baptism, all claim that their viewpoint is, you guessed it, biblical. We can't agree on the Lord's Supper, but all the sides claim that their position is, guess what? <laughs> biblical. We can't even agree on how to interpret the Sermon on the Mount, but everyone will believe that their way of interpreting the Sermon on the Mount is, guess what? Biblical. That is the most frustrating thing about Christianity. Now, how do you handle that? How do you, how do you how do you deal with such disunity and so many differing contradictory viewpoints? I think every Christian uh, deals with it differently. I think many just kind of say, "Well, I can't worry about all of the disagree- disagreements. This is what I believe." And they just it, they don't let it bother them. Some of us it just drives us absolutely crazy. But the one thing I, I, after all of the years of ministry, after all of the years doing Christian podcasts and all the things I've done, this is the one absolute thing I can be sure of. All of the disagreements, all of the problems, when you just take away all of the language, all of the talking, all of the fighting, and you, you just, you strip everything down to its very basic issue, it's always a hermeneutical issue. How do we interpret the scriptures? What method of hermeneutics are we using? How, 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 how much are we really going to dig into the scriptures? Through observation first, then interpretation, and then application. It, it really, it almost always comes down to that. Now, I, I, I completely understand that you can have people who hold to the very same hermeneutical method and still come up with a disagreement. But, but if there was an agreed upon hermeneutical method that people actually knew and used, I think it would reduce the amount of disagreement dramatically. But we can't even agree on what hermeneutical method we should u- utilize. So there's no ag- if there's no agreement on hermeneutics, then there can never be an agreement on the doctrine that flows from hermeneutics, which is biblical interpretation. In other words, if there's not an agreed upon system of, of biblical interpretation, there can never be agreed upon conclusions because those conclusions are based off everyone's system of interpretation. You have to agree on how you're interpreting the scripture if you ever hope to agree on the interpretation of scripture. But it, it's it's just... It's just, it's maddening to me. It is so frustrating. But when you come to complementarianism and egalitarianism, I mean, the two sides are never going to agree. Now, if you look at the landscape of evangelical Christianity, I think you can see which side continues to gain momentum and which side continues to grow. And that is the egalitarian view. More and more denominations are ordaining women. More and more uh, denominations are allowing women to preach uh, from the pulpit, say, in a Sunday service. This is becoming more and more common. And I think you're going to see almost an egalitarian takeover of the American church and in regard in this way. In In the majority of denominations... And in the and and in, in, in a more in a widespread large way, the egalitarian it's going to be the egalitarian takeover of the church, all right. And we know we know how how this is going to work. I mean, if you don't know how this is going to work, you can just just stay with me, and I'll go ahead and make the prediction. All right? It's going to work like this: people fought against the egalitarian view for a very long time. Most denominations and most churches would not allow women to preach from the pulpit. Most churches in denomination would not allow women to be ordained to ministry. Then we had, obviously, the very liberal churches start caving in and allowing women to be ordained to ministry in places of leadership and to preach, right? So that became kind of common in many liberal churches. You also saw this beginning to spread in the charismatic world. 
charismatic world, let women preach, women can minister, women can be ordained to ministry. So you, you, and in many cases, some of those charismatic churches would be considered conservative in many areas, but in this area, they begin to kind of adopt the egalitarian view. So liberal churches, many charismatic churches, and then it just began to continue to grow and grow and grow. And now we have to deal with the Southern Baptist and what they are doing. And the Southern Baptists, well, that's that. That'll be a major turning point. We'll get to them in just a minute. But you're going to. It's just. It's you know, It's going. It's spread from the liberal churches, and now it's making its way into what many would call more conservative churches, more conservative denominations. Now, oh, give it about five to ten years, the egalitarian view will completely have taken over the majority of Christianity. Now, there'll always be those independent churches and small denominations that will fight against it. But for the majority, egalitarianism is going to win. And then guess what? Slowly but surely, while that, the egalitarian system is taking over, guess what's going to be falling from that? And we're already starting to see it in many of the liberal churches, ordaining of uh, openly uh, homosexuals who are, who are involved in a homosexual relationship and hom- homosexual actions the ordaining of transgender, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the egalitarian will sweep over and then coming behind that will be all the other type of ordaining this and that. And at some point, I I think we should just, I mean, I don't even know why you would even pretend or maintain that there should be any rules for ministry. At that point, you just throw out all rules, right? Because why even create any rules for ministry when you're basically arguing that the Bible doesn't have any rules for ministry? But but we I, I I don't see I I don't see the egalitarian view losing any ground. I, I only see that gaining ground and then following from that will be the ordaining of well all kinds of other situations. Again, uh, we, I just uh, have an article here of a Baptist church ordaining uh, a, a a transgender. Now it wasn't a Southern Baptist church, but again, it, it's this is just the way it's going to go. It's just the way it's going to to happen. And you better be prepared for it. You're going to wake up one day, you're going to look at Christianity and go, what? What happened? And it, we're going to see I, I, the egalitarian view is going to take over, I think, in the next five to 10 years. I mean, you start counting how many denominations already ordain women or let women preach. You can almost, I don't know if it's reached a majority, but it's probably getting close and close, at least of major denominations, maybe not of independent churches or or maybe really insignificant smaller denominations, but the major denominations, I think it's pretty much close to there, but we, we will we will see. So why am I talking about this? Complementarianism and egalitarianism, because we have an issue developing in the Southern Baptist Convention. Now, when the Southern Baptist Convention started meeting this past week, um, what, there was a lot of issues that were being brought up. Obviously, critical race theory was getting a lot of discussion. They were going to elect a new president. Um, we had uh, the possible issue of what happened in Rick Warren's church. Um, and if you don't know, Rick Warren's church, Saddleback Church, ordained three women to ministry. Now, Rick Warren's church is one of the largest churches Southern, it's affiliated with the Southern Baptist Convention. It's a part of the Southern Baptist Convention. So was it going to be brought up? Was it going to be addressed? Were they going to do anything about it? All right. Now, again, there was a lot of issues going on at the Southern Baptist Convention. I'm not going to go through all all of them. But obviously, critical race theory was one of the big issues that people, uh, you know, were talking about. And I, well, I won't go back through all of that. So, but one of the issues I felt needed to be discussed was the whole situation with Rick Warren's church. Well, it looks like it's going to be addressed. It looks like it's going to be addressed, but I am, to be honest with you, extremely confused about what is going on here. Let me uh, find the article. Here we go. This was published on Friday, so published yesterday. All right, SBC, Southern Baptist Convention, SBC Committee, to consider disaffiliating Saddleback Church for ordaining women pastors. All right. Now, if if they do this, this will be the Southern Baptist Convention taking a firm stand, and this would be one of the largest Protestant denominations pushing back, saying, no, we're not going to do this. We're not going to allow this. We're going, we're going to stop this. And if your church does this, we're going to disaffiliate you and basically remove you from the Southern Baptist Convention. All right. This... 
This, this, is a, this is a big turning point. If the Southern Baptist Church, if the Southern Baptist Convention fails to do anything, then for all practical purposes, the largest Protestant denomination in, in the United States of America will be, well, they're, they're going to succumb to the egalitarian view, and pretty much Southern Baptist churches would be free to, to ordain women without any fear of, of any kind of punishment from the convention, from the denomination itself. So this is a big thing. What is going to happen? Let's see what they have to say here in the article. A committee within the Southern Baptist Convention is set to consider whether a, whether a prominent megachurch led by best-selling author Rick Warren can continue in fellowship with the denomination after it ordained three women pastors last month. And here at the top of the article, they have the photograph of what happened there at Saddleback Church. We've already talked about this in the past. Uh, this, is, this is, again, a major turning point here. At the annual meeting of the Southern Baptist Church this week in Nashville, a motion asking if the denomination should break fellowship with Saddleback Church in Orange County, California, was referred to the denomination's Credentials Committee. The Credentials Committee is tasked with evaluating whether SBC-associated churches meet the denomination's standards of faith and practice. The megachurch posted on social media that it ordained three of uh, female pastors on a historic Thursday night, which drew criticism from Baptist leaders who believe female ordination goes against SBC teaching and praise from supporters of women in ministry. The motion was introduced by Pastor Shad Tibbs, S-H-A-D, a Fellowship Baptist Church in Trout, Louisiana. The church is led by Warren uh, the author of the me mega best uh, bestseller, The Purpose Driven Life. The 67-year-old Warren recently announced that he is searching for his successor amid plans to retire. During a press conference following his SBC presidential election victory, incoming SBC president Ed Litton was asked whether churches that ordain women should be kicked out of the denomination. And this is his, and uh, here's his answer. And I quote, um, uh, as a, or I'm, I'm sorry, this part is not in, this is not something that's in quotes. So as a self-professed complementarian, Litton said, now as a self-professed complementarian, that is not in quotes. So I don't know if, I don't think Litton actually said that. It sounds like the only thing he said was the, the following words. That's something we'll, we're, we've going to have to work out, end quote. That's something we're going to have to work out. What, what do we? What do you mean? Is something we're going to have to work out? Either the Southern Baptist Convention is opposed to the ordination of women to ministry and allowing women to preach. It's either opposed to it or it's not opposed to it. What, what do you have to work out? Hey, our, the 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 doctrinal standard for the Southern Baptist Convention prohibits women be, from being ordained to ministry. There, there's nothing to work out. It's either. It either is or it isn't. It's just, it sounds such like a political answer to me. But here's the issue with Ed Litton. He may not support women being ordained to ministry, but it appears that he has no problem with women preaching from the pulpit, I guess, as long as a man is standing next to them. Because I guess if the man is standing next to them, that provides some kind of authoritative cover for them. And we have, it appears, videos of Ed Litton and his church. I've got them right here. Here's the story. Breaking SBC presidential candidate's wife. Now, this was written before he became pre uh, the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. So we could put SBC president candidates, or SBC president's wife preaches at his church. And then there's a screen uh, uh, capture from the video He's standing next to her. She's standing behind their little podium. Um, and it's not even really a pulpit, but I don't know what. It looks like one of those little things you would hold music on. And she's standing there with a microphone and she's preaching. And there's video after video here of them preaching, right? And I mean, there's one, two, three. It looks like four, at least four videos. So if he is he a strict complementarian? Or is he kind of a moderate complementarian? Is he kind of a, a, a liberal complementarian? Now, he, now, according to the story, 
again, they have in the story, which again, it's just interesting. I, I wish we could find out if it, if he said this, because it says as a self-professed complementarian. So I guess Lytton is a self-professed complementarian, but if he didn't refer to himself in that way, and if all he said, that's something we're going to have to work out, that's a little troubling. It's like, there's nothing to work out. A church that goes against the doctrinal standard of the Southern Baptist Convention about the ordination of women has to be removed. I mean, what is there? I don't understand what there is to work out. The motion uh, from the Louisiana pastor comes amid heightened tension in the denomination about what scripture says about gender, particularly whether or not women are permitted to hold certain offices and preach in church. So I guess there's growing, look, there's heightened tensions about the issue. All right, heightened tension uh, about the issue. What does that mean? That indicates the egalitarian view is taking, is gaining traction inside Southern Baptist churches. There's just no way to get around it. So again, give it five, 10 years. The egalitarian view is going to become the dominant view. I just, I really believe it's going to become the dominant view. And if Southern Baptists make it through this little situation, like let's say they remove Rick Warren, well, number one, let, if they remove Rick Warren, it'll be interesting to see how many churches uh, either just go full-blown rebellion and they start ordaining women, right, to push the issue, or how many churches just leave the Southern Baptist Convention and go, and go well, start another denomination or just become independent churches. It'll be interesting because you know that there's a lot of Southern Baptist churches out there probably waiting to see what is going to happen to Rick Warren. And if nothing happens, they're going to do it. Or maybe if something happens to him, they're going to start doing it in protest. I I think we have to at least be uh, open to that possibility. Um, They go on to say our culture. Let's see here. Um, All right, that's from a, okay, never mind. (laughs) That's that's, uh, under an ad. An unseen crisis is destroying our nation. Okay, so let's skip the ad here. Okay, the Baptist and Faith Message 2000 plainly states that the pastoral office is limited to men as qualified by scripture. So that's the Baptist faith and message. That should be the governing document to churches in the Southern Baptist Convention. And Rick Warren completely just violated that. So he showed, he demonstrated no submission to authority, demonstrated no respect to the authority and did what he wanted to do. Obviously, I think with very little fear of reprisal. Because I mean, as as big as his church is, Okay, you remove us from the Southern Baptist Convention. His church is just going to go on as normal. They're not going to. They're not going to. They're not going to miss a, a beat. So, but again, it just demonstrates what's the point of the denominations if people can just do whatever they want whenever they want to do it anyway. Um, it goes on. The issue has become one of the most visible divisions in the convention, especially after the popular Bible teacher Beth Moore announced that she could no longer identify as a Southern Baptist and left the denomination. And then they go on to get into the egalitarian and complementarian views, and uh, they go there. Now, here's how it's all going to work out, all right? A couple of things. The national convention, this is very important, the national convention has yet to remove a church from fellowship for this reason, but some local and state conventions have done so. So the national convention hasn't removed anyone, but local and state conventions have. Well, wouldn't you think the local and state conventions and the national convention should all be on the same page? That that would kind of make sense to me. All right. Now, once this motion is reviewed by the credentials committee, a recommendation will be made to the executive committee. Should the executive committee decide that a church is no longer in cooperation with a denomination, the decision will be made public. Should a church opt to appeal the decision, messengers at the denomination's annual meeting may decide whether to uphold the decision. And er, so if you think about this, this could take forever before a decision ever comes down. So in the meantime, Saddleback is just going to be a part of the Southern Baptist Convention after they've ordained three women in open rebellion to the actual doctrinal statement of the Southern Baptist Convention. And now it's got to go through all of these committees and then they could appeal. It could take forever before anything actually happens. By the time something comes down, I, I mean, I mean, from my perspective, it could take forever. Maybe, maybe there's a way. All right. So, uh, I, so I'm being told here that, uh, Will, who uh, attends the Southern Baptist Church in Tennessee, that their local convention has removed a church for this reason at uh, the county level. 
All right. So again, you would think the, the national convention would, would be in agreement here. So um, in, in early May, Saddleback ordained and it names the women that they ordained. Days after the ordination uh, of the three women, the then president, and J.D. Greer said in a blog post that although he respected Saddleback's ministry and their heart for taking the gospel around the world, he disagreed with the ordination, calling the move disappointing. It, it's disappointing. <laughs> hey, it's disappointing that one of the largest churches in the SBC just completely rebelled against our doctrinal statement and did what they wanted. I, I would call that more than disappointing. I would have said, we've got to do something about it now. Now, he was the then president. That was in May. He could have said, at the, at, as soon as we get to the national convention, we're going to make this a priority and we're going to address it right then and right there. I mean, I, I don't understand like, hey, they did it. There's no denial that they did it. They openly promoted that they did it. So there's no question about them doing it. So then what do you have to investigate? Wouldn't it take like, hey, this is the president of Southern Baptist Convention. Can I talk to Rick Warren? Hey, Rick, how's it going? Hey, uh, getting some troubling information here that you ordained three women in ministry. Is that so? Yeah, it's so. Uh, you know that goes against the doctrinal statement for the Southern Baptist Convention. Are you aware of that? Yeah, I'm aware of that. Well, um, are you going to repent and revoke their ordination? No, I'm not going to repent, not going to revoke the ordination. So you now believe that it's scriptural to ordain women in ministry? Yes. Okay, well, you no longer can be a part of the Southern Baptist Convention. You understand that? Yes. Okay, well, we're going to have to part ways. I'm going to uh, bring this up to the committee. We're going to make this happen. I mean, it, how long should it take? <laughs> this is not like we've got to investigate to find out if it's true. It's, it's, a, it's all over the place. There's no question about that they did it. I mean, we've got the photo. I've got the photograph of it happening right here in front of me. There's the three women, and then there are the people laying hands on them right there. It's, it's right there. So again, what's the whole point? But I am glad that they're going to address it. I don't, here, here's what I, look. I don't know what Ed Litton is going to do. The fact that he has his wife preaching at his church is, is somewhat troubling already. I think Ed, it looks like Ed Litton is going to be. Now, this is just my, this is speculation. This is pure speculation. He, he seems in every situation that we've found when he was confronted about his non-Trinitarian stance and his doctrinal statement, he didn't answer it. It sounds like he, he, he goes into full, his very, and politician mode. Like, I'm not going to really, I'm going to address the issue by not really addressing the issue. I'm going to talk around the issue, right? So I need to know, like, I'm still, I'm still looking at the way they have, when he was supposedly asked about this, again, the, the way the Christian Post reports this, as a self-professed complementarian, that is not in quotes. So that doesn't mean Lytton seemed to say that. I've seen other sources I think placing that in quotes. So I, I really need to know, did he refer to himself as a self-professed complementarian? I don't know why he would with having his wife preach. So I don't know. But it, according to the Christian Post, that is not in quotes. And then after that, it seems the only thing he said was, that's something we're going to have to work out, end quote. So I don't know what the full quote was, because again, I've seen, two, I've seen some sources placing that first part in quotations, so I'm, I'm, I'm suspect there, but here's what I feel fear is going to happen. He's just going to find a way to try to please both sides, which ultimately I don't think he's going to, I think he's going to try to please the egalitarians, going to try to please the complementarian. And I don't think it's any way to pull that off. I think he's going to try even here. Here's what I would say here. I'll make a couple of predictions. Even if Rick Warren is removed, I think you will find either a large number of Southern Baptist churches start ordaining women to push the issue and almost in a protest, or you will have a large number of them leave the denomination, which is possible. Some may say that's a good thing. Okay, maybe. But I think the last thing the Southern Baptist Convention right now, they, they lost so many members in you know 2020. We did a whole podcast episode about how many members they lost. I think they're going to want to do everything they can to keep that from happening. So I, I don't know if they're going to maybe offer, like they're going to try to come some middle ground. Hey, we're going to publicly rebuke Rick Warren. Hey, Rick Warren, don't ever do that again. And that's it. I, I, I don't know. I just, I just don't, even if Rick Warren goes, the issue is not over. I think we can all agree with that. 
And I think the egalitarian view will ultimately take over the Southern Baptist Convention. May not happen this year. You see, we're in 2021. I say by 2026. I give it five years. Give it five years. Five years, it's, it's over. It's done. And then the Southern Baptist Convention will be the largest Protestant denomination and will be ordaining women to ministry. I think, I think, I don't, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I just think give it five years and it's gone. It's done. And I mean, the fact, if the Southern Baptist Convention is not even going to deal with the whole Trinitarian issue with the Southern Baptist uh, president, if you didn't hear that episode, you can go back and listen to it from yesterday. Um, If they're not going to deal with that, then I, I mean, are, are they even going to do anything about anything related to theology? So that I'm glad they're, they're looking at it. I just think it's, I think it's inevitable where, where this is going. And let me just give you another example if I can find the article. I think I shared it with people in the church. Let me see if I can find it. Um, because it's just another example of where things are going. Right, give me one second here. Let me find it here. Yeah, here it is. Open up the article. This was published on June the 16th, all right? June the 16th. Baptist Church ordains first known transgender pastor in denominations history, all right? Uh, I see here. Uh, so this, this is for our information before I get to this story. Uh, the next convention is in Southern California in Anaheim. Uh, in Anaheim, media coverage will likely be different and not near as many pastors from the eastern side of the country will be able to attend. That, that is interesting. We'll, we'll have to see. So maybe, maybe by next year, maybe we'll have. I don't know. I, depending on who you talk to, Ed Litton is definitely being referred to. Uh, the way most of the mainstream media has, has reported the the election of Ed Litton as president of the Southern Baptist Convention, they've definitely reported it as the Southern Baptist Church stops from going far right and they adopting a moderate position. Well, if he's adopted as a moderate, if he's elected as a moderate, thinking from a political perspective, he's put there to try to appease both sides, to try to keep everyone happy, to stop the loss of of of, of of church members and a loss of churches leaving the SBC. I think from a theological perspective, moderate doesn't work. Ultimately, you just leave, you're just you going to leave both sides unsatisfied and both sides frustrated. Um, you, you have to just pick a side. Theologically being moderate, it just doesn't work. You have to pick, you got to pick a side on theological issues. You got to pick a side, egalitarian or complementarian. You got to pick a side. Trinitarian, a non-Trinitarian. Yeah, I mean, you've got, you can't just like try to walk this middle ground. I, I, I just, I think it's a recipe for disaster. I could be wrong. There are people who know far more about Southern Baptist politics and all of that than I do. But uh, yeah, it just seems like that that's what he was brought in to try to appease everyone. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens next year. But let's get back to this story. Uh, the Baptist Church ordains first known transgender pastor and denominations history. An Indiana congregation affiliated with the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship has ordained who is believed to be the first confirmed transgender pastor in the denomination's history. Now, why am I bringing this up? I've stated it before. This is the way it always works. Once you have something starting, you have, within Christianity, you have the very, very conservative, kind of, you know, conservative point of view, and then you'll have the very, very liberal. Now, where the liberals are today is in many cases where the conservatives will be 10 or 15 years later. The conservatives will fight against that liberal movement, but ultimately that what happens, we can go all the way back to the, the beginning of, of basically higher critical uh, or uh, higher criticism, I almost mixed it with a critical race theory, higher criticism coming into the church, the modernism, the, the, the liberal evangelicalism, and you had many, uh, which ultimately led, and you could argue, to kind of the birth of the fundamentalist movement. We can go back through church history and work through all of this. But, but the fundamentalists fought against it, fought against what was going on, and all of that. Many of the evangelicals were like, we don't want to be fighting. We don't want to fight. We don't want to fight, but we're not going to adopt some of this. Well, ultimately, give it 
10, 15, 20 years, many of the evangelicals ultimately gave in to a lot of that liberal modernism that was coming into the church. They ultimately gave into it. The fundamentalist, ultimately over time, they started, it gave maybe 10, 15, 20 years behind, then many of the fundamentalist churches stopped looking like fundamentalist churches and looking like the modern day evangelical churches. There have been entire books written about, you know, what's happening in fundamentalist churches. So it's always, it's just a, it's just weird. You can see, you can see something be entered, to enter into quote unquote Christianity Way over here in the liberal side, the conservatives will rail against it, condemn it, and speak against it and say, wrong, 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 but just give it 10 years, give it 15 years, and then ultimately but surely the church changes. And here's the way it works. It's very simple. The church changes based off the changes of the people. If the people change, the church always seems to adapt to the people which is completely antithetical to everything the Bible. The Bible would be like, no, you stay firm. You preach the same message, the same doctrine, and you don't compromise in season and out of season. That means there may come a time that everyone's leaving your church and there's no one there, but you don't change it because, oh, oh, the people are changing their views. If the people change their views, the people change their views, but you can't change to accommodate them. But ultimately, churches always change to accommodate the people because money, buildings, budgets. And, and I understand that. I, again, I understand that if I was a pastor and my livelihood was depended upon how much money my church was bringing in, I would be far more tempted to compromise than when your, your livelihood's not dependent. When your livelihood's not dependent upon it, you're not even taking money from the church. Guess what? You'll stand behind the pulpit and say whatever you want to say because you're like, what are you going to do? Get rid of me? Fine. I you're not supporting me, so it doesn't matter. But when you're, you realize that your next paycheck, we all know how that works. And your normal job, there's times you have to put up with stuff you don't like because you know if you, do, if you say this or you do this, you're going to lose your job. You Sometimes you just got to be quiet and go along with it. Well, there's many pastors who have to do the same thing. So we have a Baptist church here who just ordained the first transgender. Okay, well, that, that's, that's way over here to the left. Right now, now over here in the conservative world, they're fighting against egalitarian. Well, the liberals already gave up that battle against egalitarianism a long time ago. So now the conservatives are fighting what the what the liberals brought in a long time ago. The conservatives are just way behind, and now ultimately they'll start caving. And now the transgender issue will ultimately move over to the conservative churches. Just give it ten or fifteen years down the road. But let's read about this. An Indiana congregation affiliated with the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship has ordained who is believed to be the first confirmed transgender pastor in the denomination's history. Um, a trans-identified individual. Our first name is Laura, uh, Laura Bethany. I'm not, uh, not even going to try to pronounce the last name. A trans-identified individual who identifies as female was ordained at University Baptist Church of Bloomington in a ceremony held last month. So last month, um, <laughs> so just think about that. Last month, uh, this church was ordaining a transgender. Um, and, and in May, uh, Rick Warren was ordaining women. You just, you see, it's just, just everything keeps go, going in the same direction. It just one is ahead of the other, one's behind the other. Um, an interview with the Christian Post on Tuesday, uh, the individual who was ordained, Laura Bethany, credited a meeting with the late progressive Christian writer, Rachel Held Evans, with helping to reignite a childhood interest in ordained ministry. She introduced me to a committee that were both faithful and affirming of LGBTQ people. I began to study with the Reformation Project. I attended, isn't that an interesting, uh, a Reformation Project, okay. I attended conferences, helped to organize, and then traveled to the first free, okay, I don't know what this, this meeting is, the first free mom hugs tour from Oklahoma to Stonewall Inn. I don't know what the first free mom hugs tour is, okay? Uh, what, what, what's happening within some worlds of Christianity? I have no idea. The first free mom hugs. What? I, I don't know what that is, okay? I'm, I could probably look it up, but I won't do that right now. It, it says, I, this individual said, I, I re-entered Baptist culture through Wilshire Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, at a time when they were discerning their status as an open and affirming church. It was there the call to serve the church was revived. 
uh, Laura Bethany told uh, Christian Post that the ordination was not to a specific congregation and will initially take on the role of interim pastor for four months at the United Church of Christ congregation in Green River, Wyoming. Well, that's interesting. So ordained Baptist, but going to be serving as a pastor in a United Church of Christ. Yeah, the church, the church in America has no theological issues at all. Trust me, we shouldn't even we shouldn't even be worried about theology. All we should talk about on Christian radio and podcasts is critical race theory. There's nothing to see here. There, there's not a problem at all. Uh, many, especially theological conservatives, such as Texas Baptist mega church pastor Robert Jeffress. Now, let's we won't get into him. He, I, I don't even call him theologically conservative. Uh, Pastor Robert Jeffress from Dallas, Texas, very familiar with him, not far from where I'm, I'm, I'm currently speaking to you from, um, is po- so politically hijacked, it's not funny. But he says he uh, that this individual, this pastor, Pastor Robert Jeffress, have argued that the transgender idea ideology is inherently incompatible with Christianity. It's not that confusing, said Jeffress in a 2016 sermon. In Matthew 19, 4, God's, word, God's words are applicable. The Bible says God made them from the beginning, male and female, not male, female, and question mark. God has determined how many sexes there are. There are two, not three. Gender identity confusion is an emotional disorder that should be treated professionally and compassionately. Gender identity confusion should not be exploited by social activists like those uh, in in President Barack uh, Obama administration who want to deny the God-given distinction between the sexes. This is a rebellion against God's plan. Now, that's typical Robert Jeffress. He has to bring in Barack Obama. He has to bring in some kind of liberal politics. He has to bring in politics because he can't just preach the sermon of what the biblical, what the Bible says. He's got to always go and make it political because, well, that's another problem in the church, but we won't go there now. Uh, In response, uh, Laura, what's her name again? Laura, let me find, Laura Bethany, Laura Bethany, um, let's see here, and, 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 and a response says, I believe that to accept the complex expressions of gender we have seen through, the, through human history is not an affront to God's sovereignty, but a testimony to God's immense creativity. In my case, this was further demonstrated when I was diagnosed with an intersex condition, being born uh, with both male and some female organs. Now, see that those are always situations where things get very complicated. Okay, so how do you deal with that? We we would have to have a rational, important conversations about this that goes beyond the scope of this right now. He goes, I either had to view my body as a mistake or allow for the fact that God is truly the master creator operating outside the boundaries of gender binaries. Um, the, that this person goes on to say they drew a parallel to Jesus' acceptance of eunuchs, as explained in Matthew nineteen twelve. However, the pastor also acknowledged that LGBTQ identity is not directly equivalent to the status of eunuchs in biblical times. Well, I'm at least I'm glad you at least acknowledge that. My calling into ordained ministry is not intended to cater to the comfort of all. Neither does it require the affirm, affirmation of all. Uh, University Baptist Church pastor Annette Hill. Briggs explained to the Christian Post that the ordination came after the individual had two years of supervised ministry internship and graduated from seminary with a Master of Divinity degree. All right. And again, please note uh, the University Baptist Church pastor, Annette Hill Briggs. Sounds like that that's a female. So you already have the egalitarian. So the egalitarian view came first and then they go, then they start bringing in uh, to uh, ordain transgender. See how that works? Um, it says, they go on to say uh, that the uh, ordination was a popular decision as it was unanimously approved by the church. And as of June, no one left the congregation in protest. 99% of the response we've received locally and online has been joyfully supportive, while a handful of strangers have been positively you know, rude and cruel towards them um, and their church. And again, that doesn't help. Uh, If you disagree, don't, don't email people being rude and cruel and calling people names. I don't know why Christians engage in that stuff. I get it in my email box all the time. 
calling people names and being rude. You don't prove your point. You don't, because you're acting in an unbiblical way. So even whatever the issue is becomes irrelevant because you, your own sin and how you're treating other people. You can disagree with people in the transgender world. You don't have to be rude and mean and call names and derogatory. It doesn't <sighs> just act like a Christian, maybe. Okay, you can disagree. You can speak against it. You can be strong. You can speak bluntly against it. Just don't turn it into personal attacks, right? It says, uh, none have accepted my invitation to talk together about our differences. So in other words, the people who've emailed them throwing out all the accusations, none have accepted their inv- the invitation to talk about the differences. Um, and I've noticed that as well. The people who are usually rude and mean and say all kinds of cruel things, either, you know, YouTube comments or, or when you try to say, let's have a discussion, they don't want to have a discussion, uh, which that's just, oh, I hate that. Um, so, so none has accepted the invitation to talk about the differences that we might witness to, now this is, now listen to this, that we might witness to our oneness in Christ and kindly talk about our differences. Only one person who disagrees with us has reached out in a Christ-like manner. So one person reached out in a Christ-like manner, the rest did not. But just catch that phrase, our oneness in Christ. This is such a common, let's emphasize our oneness in Christ. Now, let's make it very clear. Oneness in Christ does not mean that we, we, we somehow just overlook doctrinal theological differences and interpretation of scriptural differences. You can talk about the oneness in Christ, but that can never become a code to, to say, let's not argue, let's all just get together. No, there, there's oneness in Christ does not mean that we, we compromise on biblical and doctrinal truth. Um, now, listen to this. All right, now this is very important. In 1999, the church left the Southern Baptist Convention after it made Briggs its pastor despite the S- SBC stance against female ordination. All right, so... Uh, so they left uh, the Southern Baptist Convention over the ordination of the woman. So the, the woman who was ordained, they left the Southern Baptist Convention over that in 1999. Now here we are in 2021, and now Rick Warren just openly did it. All right, see how I tell you it's always about 10 years behind, right? See how it works? And now they're ordaining a transgender. So see, they ordained a transgender 10 years after ordaining a woman. You see how that works? It's always, or it's a little over 10 years. You, you, you see how, that's, that's how it always progresses. So you've got to see, when you look, you've got to look at where things are now, maybe over in the far liberal side, to see where things are going to be on your conservative church 10 years from now. I, I hate to say that, but that's how it always tends to work. Um, now, so now affiliated with a cooperative Baptist fellowship, Briggs told the Christian Post that the denomination does not have an official stance on LGBT issues, and so there is no expectation of institutional pushback for the ordination. For clarification, I'm not the first transgender person to be ordained in a Baptist church. I may, I may be just the second and the first in a cooperative Baptist fellowship church. So I guess that... Uh, there may be a transgender person, uh, I guess, ordained in another kind of Baptist church, maybe. Um, I'm very grateful for those who have gone before me, and I'm very aware that we are still pioneers in this space. All right? And then just to give you another, I'll just give you some, I'll just, I'll just show you where things are going. The Evangelical Lutheran Church of America becomes first mainline denomination to elect transgender bishop. See, there's the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, okay? Uh, okay, clergy of Europe's largest Lutheran denomination declares their churches are now trans-inclusive. So, so it's just, it, that, like, that's where things are going with the trans situation, right? So, but over here in the Southern Baptist, we now are going to have a, ba- a battle over egalitarianism. And that's... And so the Southern Baptists, I don't know what they're going to do. I don't know what they're going to do. I think even if they, even if they do, quote unquote, the right thing now, it's literally, it's, it's only a temporary reprieve because the egalitarian view is going to take over. And then we know what follows that. We know what follows that. You, you're seeing it. ELCA, you got the largest Lutheran denomination in uh, Europe. Uh, I mean, you, you got the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. I mean, just... 
just continue to see where things are going. And it's going to continue to go that way. And, and it's, it, here's the thing. And I'll end it with this. The conservative churches, the conservative denominations, if you spend your time getting sa- sidetracked and distracted by all of these culture wars, getting sidetracked and distracted by politics, you're not going to be equipping people biblically and theologically and from an understanding of church history to deal with what's coming. You can't fight all of the quote-unquote liberal wokeness coming into the church through political talk and through politics and through that. You've got to equip the people through scripture, doctrine, theology, proper hermeneutics. That's where the emphasis has to be. And it just seems like you got the liberal churches and you look there and you're like, what is going on over there? That's insane, right? I don't know what's happening there. And then you look over to the conservative churches and you're like, you've turned into the Republican Party. I don't know what's going on there. And then for those of us in the middle, we're like, we're not, we're not, I'm not, this is my world right now. This is where I am. And I've said it before. If my church was to end, I don't even know where I would go to church. Because here's the thing, I wouldn't be welcomed in the liberal churches because I would be too theologically conservative. In the quote-unquote theologically conservative churches, I would not be welcomed because they're so politically hijacked that I'd be constantly standing against all of the politics that's crept into the church. So where would I go? I'd be a a person in, in no man's land. It's like you shouldn't have to choose between the, you know, quote unquote woke church versus the Republican hijacked church. How about just find a church where we focus on scripture, doctrine, and theology? And I, I, I think it's, it's, that's just where we are. But I'm, and, and I understand that if you're in Christianity right now and you're looking around going, oh no. So over here, this is happening with transgender, the homosexual, pro-LGBTQ movement, and all the woke ideology and woke, okay, okay, man, we got to do something about that. So you want to fight against it. And I know your first instinct is maybe to try to fight it like in a political way, but that's that's bad. And then, and then over here in the far right, you're, you're looking around going, okay, guys, what, what's happened to us? What, what, why, why do we think, you know, we want to be identified with Trump and want to be identified that way? Shouldn't we be identified by Christ? And it's like, I, I, no matter which direction you go, it's, I, it's a mess. I can understand people wanting to fight against the woke concept, but there's got to be a way to do so biblically. So I don't know where the Southern Baptist Church, Southern Baptist Convention is going. The, the, the election of this president is, I think, troubling, especially with the revelation of the whole Trinitarian issue that, as far as I know, still is not being addressed. The fact that his wife is preached at his church, I, I don't know what that means, and and he won't really answer questions. He seems to talk around them. This just seems like a train wreck that we're all going to watch happen in real time. For those who are Southern Baptist, I understand, and now I will say this. I understand that, and this is the really weird world of being Southern Baptist. Right here where I'm sitting, there's Southern Baptist churches around me. There's one, what, three miles, four miles back into Tuscola, Texas. That's the church that I became a Christian in, right? So that's First Baptist Church of Tuscola, Texas. It's Southern Baptist. If you were to walk in that Southern Baptist church, so many of these issues that we're talking about would be as foreign to them as foreign is. They Probably nobody there could even articulate what critical race theory is. Uh, they're definitely never going to ordain women. Um, they're they're, they're going to be very conservative, going to be conservative politically, obviously, but it, they're going to be a very conservative church. But the issue is if you are a part of a denomination where everything's crumbling around you, you're electing a president who possibly is not even a Trinitarian in any meaningful way, whose wife is preaching from the pulpit, I don't care what you're doing. You're part of a denomination that's doing things opposite. So you've got to address yourself. Why would you be a part of it? Why would you be associated with it? At some point, you've got to come out from among them and, and be separate. You can't continue to, to compromise. In a sense, it's a form of compromise. It's a compromise by association. It's a compromise by numerical support because you're being counted. How many people, I mean, in most Southern Baptist churches, they keep track of how many people attend uh, you know, Sunday school, the morning worship, and then those numbers are reported back to maybe their local 
the local affiliate, but they're, they're, those numbers are recorded and, and, and reported so that the denomination can keep track of how many people are attending services. Well, you're, that means you're a part of it. And in some cases, certain monies may go to their missions project and other, and other uh, things, you know, or, or what other funds that, that things may go to. You, you, churches are going to have to make hard decisions. They're going to have to make some hard decisions because I, I think, I don't know, Will may know. I don't know how, how long is a person elected president in the Southern Baptist Convention? Is it for one year, for two years? I don't know how long they are elected for. I don't, I don't know how long they serve. Um, but forever how long they serve, um, I think this, this, ten, this term for the current president of the Southern Baptist Convention is going to be filled with a lot of uncertainty and a lot of confusion. And I, I don't think... I don't think it's not going to resolve the problems. I think it's it's an attempt to try to I think it's an attempt to try to calm a lot of the concerns, but it's not going to resolve anything. I don't I don't think resolution was the goal here. I think it's trying to keep peace and keep it intact before they lose more people. I I I, I don't think they picked a, a clear side on how they're going to deal with a lot of the issues swirling around the Southern Baptist Convention. And, and a lot of troubling things have come out over the na- uh, last na- last few days. Um, okay, so Greer was three years. Okay, that makes sense. I knew I knew he had been there, and it may have been due to the pandemic. It may have been. So I don't know if it's three. I don't know if it's two years. I don't. I, I can de- because they didn't meet uh, because of the pandemic. So that was one year that he was going to remain president just because of that. So it may be a two year term. Uh, whatever the term is, I think we're we're going to look for. Um, a lot of difficulties that are not going to be resolved. I mean, because you, you have to either elect someone who's who's going to be liberal and take the church that way or conservative and fight against it. But hey, what do I know about denominational politics? I'm not by no means, an, I'm not an expert in any way, shape or form. I don't, I don't get the whole thing. The whole thing is just confusing to me. It's just a mess. Um, and maybe, maybe that's, I would never, I would never succeed in that environment. Let's put it that way. I would never succeed in that environment because uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say the right things. I wouldn't please the right people. My, my advancement in a denomination would, la- I would never advance. It, might, it would be like, oh, this church is a part of our denomination. How did that happen? All right, let's silence that person because I would be the one offering criticism of everything the denomination is doing because why offer den- criticism for those outside of the denomination? Let's focus on what's going on inside of the denomination. And the Southern Baptists, they've got a lot of problems, a lot of problems. And whatever they, whatever they accomplish with Rick Warren, we'll see. We will see. But I'm telling you, it's temporary. It's temporary. Egalitarian will take over. It's, it's that simple. They're going to take over. Uh, the women... Women are becoming far more uh, vocal about this. There are more and more women who appear they want leadership, more and more women who want to preach and teach. And I think there's going to be more and more pushback. And I think, I mean, that's just the way it's going. And then you, 10 years from that, you know what's following. So that's where it goes. So I just want to at least bring this up. We've talked about it. I wish I, this is one of those situations I wish I could say something really profound, but I don't really have anything profound to say other than this just sinking feeling that it's, it's, well, it's going to get far worse. That's, that's, that's not profound. I think that's biblical. It's going to get far worse. And we're going to see, if we think we've seen a rapid decline, oh, you wait, next five years, next five years, you, you watch, you just watch the next five years. American church, yeah, it's, it's, I, I think we're going to see a decline in the next five years in a way that we have never seen before. Maybe, I, I, I think there's just no question about it. No question about it. The culture is changing so rapidly and the church is going to be doing everything it can to figure out what to do. And it, the church initial reaction to the, to the culture was politics. I, I don't know what, I don't know where we go. I don't know. Hopefully, put it this way, whatever happens, I think major denominations are going to collapse and no longer be viable options to any biblical-minded Christian. They're going to have to leave those denominations. And then I think we're going to have a lot of independent churches, and I don't know how those independent churches are going to fare. I don't I don't know, but we'll have to see. All right, I'll stop right there. You can contact me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com.
God bless.